Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, we're going to explore a technology that you've likely heard of, but that I argue it's finally time to master, Docker. I'll show you how to install Docker, set it up, run Doom, spin up a web server, create your own custom containers, use Docker Hub, and much more. Now, imagine that you want to run a particular application. So you take a machine, you install the operating system, and then you install any dependencies for the app that you want to use, and then you install the app, and you finally get it all configured, and you set it up the way that you like. But you can't take it with you, and you're tied to that machine. But now imagine that there's a way to package up all that work so that anyone can launch it on any machine anytime from anywhere. Well, that's Docker. Docker is also this episode's sponsor because it just made sense, although they didn't get any input into the video and didn't get to see it before it aired. So let's nerd out in a way that I doubt they could foresee. At its most basic, Docker is a system that allows you to package up all the requirements, software, and configuration for an application or installation and then bundle it as a standalone container. That container holds everything needed to set up and run the application, and the container can be run on any system that has Docker installed without any other configuration or installation. It just works. Your containers can even run seamlessly across Windows, Linux, and Mac. Docker takes care of that layer for you. Whether we expect to be content running other people's pre-made containers or to create our own, the first thing we need to do is to install Docker on our system. This will install both the Docker client and the Docker engine, so let's have a quick look at the relatively simple installation process. Installation varies by system, but on the Mac, I simply drop it into applications, open up applications, and as soon as it is copied, I can double click it to run it. We'll accept the agreement, I'll pick the recommended settings, I'll sign in, and then I'll select, of course, full stack developer for only exclusive hobby projects. And with that, Docker and its daemon are up and running. With Docker installed, we've essentially gained two major programs, docker.exe, the client piece, and docker.d.exe, the daemon or the engine. Now, maybe in the comments you can let me know why in Unix originally, and in Linux today, background processes are called daemons. Is it because they never die or you can't kill them? I don't really get it. I'm sure there's a history lesson there, but I don't know it, so let me know. Why not call them Forrest Gumps? They're always running. Anyway, regardless of why it's called a daemon, the Docker D process runs in the background at all times, and behind the scenes, these two components communicate with each other through a REST API. Every command executed by the Docker client will be translated to that REST API, this is all behind the scenes, and then sent on and processed by the daemon. We don't need to worry about all this plumbing any further, and so we won't. For our purposes, we use the Docker client, mostly via the command line, and it does what it needs to do behind the scenes to fulfill our requests. To test our installation, let's run a demo container. Where are we going to get this container? Well, from the web, through a service known as Docker Hub. It's like a big library where people can store and share their container images, and it's great because you don't have to worry about taking your containers with you. You can check it into the Docker Hub, and then you can run it from any machine that has Docker installed and an internet connection. Let's try it with the demo container, somewhat predictably named Hello-World. All we need to do is to go to the command line and type in docker run hello-world. With that, Docker will run off to the web, hit the Docker Hub, download the container automatically, and then launch it on your machine. And if everything is working end-to-end -end as it should be, we'll get some output from the program welcoming us to the world of Docker. This process actually took four steps. First, the Docker client program called the Docker daemon via that REST API and communicated what it is that we're trying to do, which is to run a container. Then the Docker engine pulled the Hello World image from the Docker Hub, created a new container on the machine to host it, and executed it. And because the output was streamed back across the API to our Docker client, we were able to see its output. Containers represent a significant advancement in software development and management, encapsulating much more than just software and configuration. They can package an entire runtime environment, which includes the application code, its dependencies, libraries, binaries, and all necessary configuration files. This complete approach ensures that everything needed for the application to run is bundled within the container, guaranteeing compatibility and reducing conflicts. One of the key features of containers is their ability to provide isolation. Through technologies like namespaces and control groups, containers create isolated environments for applications, separating them and the host from each other. Namespaces give each container its own distinct view of system resources, such as process IDs, network interfaces, and file systems, while C groups limit and monitor the resources that each container can use, such as CPU, memory, and disk I.O. 
This isolation is crucial for maintaining application stability and security, preventing applications from ever interfering with one another. Containers also excel in portability. By packaging the application and its dependencies together, containers ensure that the application will run consistently across different environments, including on Mac, Linux, and Windows, whether in development, testing, or production. This consistency eliminates the classic problem of it works on my machine by ensuring the same environment is replicated wherever the container runs. Furthermore, containers are platform independent. They can run on any system that supports the container runtime, whether it's on-premises, in the cloud, or on your developer's laptop. There's a great old Docker meme. A child developer protests that it works on his machine, and the senior developer proclaims, then we'll ship your machine. And that's how Docker was born. Probably not, but it's a good meme. Efficiency is another advantage of containers. Unlike traditional virtual machines, which require a full operating system image and can be resource intensive, containers share the host system's OS kernel. The sharing reduces overhead, making containers much smaller in size and enabling them to start up quickly. The rapid startup times of containers facilitate agile development and deployment processes, allowing for rapid scaling and more efficient resource utilization. Management and orchestration of containers are streamlined through tools like Kubernetes. Docker provides a platform for developing, shipping, and running applications in containers, while Kubernetes offers an orchestration system for automating the deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. These tools are designed to handle the complexity of managing multiple containers across different environments, ensuring reliability and scalability. And security is another aspect where containers offer benefits. Containers use features like Secure Computing Mode or SecComp to restrict system calls and apply security policies through AppArmor or SE Linux profiles, controlling the resources and the actions of containers. Additionally, tools for image vulnerability scanning help ensure that container images are free from known vulnerabilities before deployment, adding an extra layer of security. Containers provide a comprehensive solution for running applications by encapsulating the entire runtime environment, offering isolation, portability, efficiency, and enhanced security. This makes containers a powerful tool in modern software development and deployment, far exceeding the capabilities of simply bundling software and configuration together. Of course, as useful as it is to build, store, and run your own containers, Docker Hub gives you access to thousands of pre-built containers that you can execute on demand. As a simple example, let's run Doom in a container. All we need to enter is the docker run command with the ID of the container that we want to run, such as docker run chasm web slash doom 1.14.0. I'm specifying the version because I know that version worked. It's almost a gigabyte to download, so depending on your network speed, it might take a few minutes to download all of the required layers. You'll notice that as a container downloads, it comes down in layers rather than all at once. Each layer represents a different set of changes to the file system. By separating the container's contents into layers, Docker can reuse layers across different containers. For example, if multiple containers use the same base image like Ubuntu, that base image is downloaded only once and then shared amongst all the containers that use it. When the Doom server is done loading and running, we need to remember that it's not running on our machine, but rather on a container within it, connected only by a single network port, 6901. So to access Doom, we browse to localhost port 6901 and our game should spring to life. Well, that's all well and good, but running Doom doesn't require a lot of setup. But let's say we want to host a web server. If you've ever set up a full web server, then you know what a pain it can be in terms of configuration and getting all the files into the right places and installing all the right packages and dependencies and so on. With Docker, we simply run the Nginx web server image and it will do everything else. There are a few common command line options that we'll use over and over again, and since you'll likely make use of them too, let's go over a few of them now. The first flag is the dash IT flag, which specifies that we're gonna run the container interactively, giving us access to its output. The next flag is the dash RM flag, which tells Docker to remove any existing copy of the container and start fresh. We also specify dash D to indicate detached, so the process will run in the background. And finally, we use dash P to map the network port in the container to one on the host. Mapping the ports can be a little complicated at first, but it simply directs the container where to hook its network ports into the real system. Since the web server container expects to be able to use port 80 for a web server, and because the real port 80 might already be in use, it gives us a way to map multiple network applications. In this case, we'll have the real port 8080 mapped to the container's port 80, and so the web server will be available on port 8080. And sure enough, if we run the container and browse to port 8080, we can see the web server running happily. 
all with a one-line command and no additional setup. We could run a completely separate independent web server on port 8081 as well by simply spinning up another container and each would run equally well, completely isolated from the other. Now that we've experienced running a few customized containerized applications, it's time to look at finally creating one of our own. Let's say we wanted to package up a particular application like BTOP, which is a very cool task manager of sorts for Linux. That means our container, like pretty much all containers these days, will be based on a Linux image and we've got to pick which one. Remember, our container will work and run on Mac, Windows, and Linux itself, even though it's based purely on Linux. The Docker engine will take care of presenting the Linux kernel API to our container. How that is implemented behind the scenes varies wildly from Windows to Mac, for example, but it's behind the scenes, so we don't have to worry about it. But we do have to pick a starting distro, and Ubuntu is the one I'm most familiar with, so let's go with that. To start building a Docker container, we need to create a file called Dockerfile that will describe what goes in to the container image. And the first line in that file will tell Docker what system to base our image on. Now, normally everything after the colon refers to a version, and unless you have a very specific reason to pick a prior working version, as we did with Doom, you can usually generally just specify latest in its place and you'll predictably get the latest version of whatever it is you're asking for. That use of the RM flag also forces local deletion of your current copy and forces it to go and get the latest copy if you want to force an update. Our next step in setting up the container from a bare Linux image will be to install BTOP on the container. In our Docker file, we specify the run command followed by the very same commands that we would run on the command line to complete the installation. Just as we would do manually, the container will now do automatically for us. Our file then ends with a CMD line that specifies the actual command to be run and this is the line that actually runs BTOP. After we've saved our Docker file, we go to the command line and we issue a docker build command, which will cause Docker to read our Docker file definition we just created and to build our container. And so the command would be docker build dash T BTOP image, and then a period to indicate current directory. To build the container image, Docker will execute all of our steps, including the apt install commands inside of our Docker file. And after about one to two minutes of processing, depending on your network speed, if all goes well, your container will pop out the other end of the process and be ready to run. To execute our local container, we use the docker run command, docker run dash rm dash it btop dash image. And with that, btop springs into action. Now, the more clever students up in the front row might be wondering why I would install btop in a container so that it runs basically alone and there's nothing else to see. Now you might think this is just a silly oversight on my part that I just figured out live now, but I assure you that what I really wanted to show you is the level of isolation that a container experiences. It cannot even see the rest of the system, let alone interact with it in any way. On Windows, it's done via the WSL2 subsystem and a combination of job objects and silos. Either way, the net effect is total isolation for your container. Fans of the channel might remember a couple of years ago that I wrote a prime sieve that I used to compare the performance of C++, C Sharp, and Python. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Sunday, Sunday. Sunday. Come, on Come on down, down tonight, down for, tonight the for the event of the decade, decade right, right here right in Dave's, Dave's garage, garage. Prepare, to prepare to get annihilated in the amazing, the astounding, the unbelievable Python <laughs> One night only, one night only, one night only. Your free ticket will get you the whole seat, but you'll only need the edge to witness more than 50 computer languages in a showdown so unhinged, we almost had to hold it in New Jersey. Since then, under the careful administration of folks like Rutger and Tudor, it has grown like wildfire, exploding to several hundred solutions spanning almost 100 different computer languages. This is all on GitHub, and if you search for GitHub Primes, you'll find it. The team has built a system where at least once a day, all the competing solutions are compiled, linked, run, and benchmarked, with the score for each language being recorded in a database that has a web app for easy viewing. I'll include a link to the results in the video description, but the more interesting part is how we acquire those results each night. You might imagine we have a super powerful machine set up that has a hundred different compilers installed. And perhaps that's one way to do it, if you can get them all to coexist on the same machine at the same time. But it's not the way we went. And I should mention it all runs on an Intel Core 2 Duo under a desk somewhere. Each language exists in its own Docker container that is configured with only the tools like the compiler and the configuration needed to build that language's project. Although most of our examples have been built on an Ubuntu base, many of the prime solutions use leaner distros like Alpine Linux to keep the overall image size down. And again, if 10 solutions use the same Alpine Linux layer, it only gets downloaded that one time. 
Most of the containers are fairly simple, but a few like the assembly language solution for 6502 or the solution that solves primes in Minecraft are reasonably complex. The beauty of it is that the complexity is compartmentalized along with just the language and tools in a single container. None of it spills over and messes up any of the other containers. I also make extensive use of Docker in managing some of my own home lab work. For example, many of the LED effects in the background here, such as the colored windows behind me, are run by a server process that uses Wi-Fi to communicate with a series of ESP32 chips. That server process, which has a thread for handling each target, runs entirely within its own container and it can be run on any machine with Docker. It even runs on a Pi. The Docker file for my container is not based on a bare Linux installation, but upon one provided by Microsoft for running ASP.NET 6 applications. It then descends into the source code folder, builds the application, publishes it, and runs it. Before our little LED server application can run, it needs to know what time it is locally, so the second stage of the Docker file runs the environment commands needed to set up the time zone. And with that, it can launch and run our server. Now, if you found today's episode to be any combination of informative or entertaining, remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you consider subscribing to my channel and leaving a like on the video. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Please do check out the free sample of my new book on Amazon, The Non-Visible Part of the Autism Spectrum. It's intended for folks that don't have an ASD diagnosis, but who suspect they might have a few characteristics that put them somewhere on the spectrum. It's everything I know now about living a successful life on the spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago. Check it out at the link in the video description. In the meantime, and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs>